Howdy, everyone. Um, we are uh, starting to fill up the room here. Um, Chuck is with us, but he's having microphone issues, so he might be uh, a silent partner for the uh, the rest of this session. We'll see, um, and we'll just give it a few minutes and uh, let the uh, let the back of the room fill up a little bit more. Um, in the meantime, if you've got any questions or shout outs, um, we can kill a couple of minutes that way. Uh, feel free. For those just joining us, we're going to give it a few more minutes to uh, uh, see if we uh, get uh, more people showing up. I think we might be competing with the weather again, um, but uh, let's give it a little bit and uh, see where we end up. Uh, question here. Keith asks if we had a good uh, weekend. Um, yeah, Chuck, you want to mime <laughs> what you got up to? I, I don't even remember. Can't have been that bad. Sailing weather, yeah, it's uh, sailing weather up here too. Um, it's been warmer and drier than um, I'm used to for May. Usually it's uh, Macbeth weather uh, this time of year, but uh, Fine, light breezes, nice up here. Get the brig out. Um, some assembly required. So uh, um, uh, Letty should be uh, up and sailing pretty, uh, pretty quick. Um, Niagara, uh, uh, probably not in the cards in the, uh, in the short term here. All right, we have uh, two minutes after. Um, uh, 
Okay. Two minutes after, three minutes after, a few people are still trickling in, but uh, um, let's let's get rolling and uh, uh, get through what we have. And uh, anybody who's a little late can uh, just uh, slide on in. So I've got uh, some slides again this week, and I've also um, very craftily craftily uh, made some uh, some models to work with. So uh, um, besides admiring my drawing skills, you'll also see my uh, my three D. Um, abilities. All right, welcome to class three of introduction to wooden shipbuilding. And uh, here again is the boilerplate um, for uh, more of the record. And uh, this is how to get a hold of us. Um, and for those just joining, uh, Chuck's having some microphone trouble, um, but uh, we'll uh, um, we'll let him uh, gesticulate any uh, interjections he has. So the third class out of a plan four, um, the recordings are uh, going up on our YouTube channel. Uh, just search Erie Maritime Museum. And uh, this is an experimental running for maybe something we'll end up doing every fall and spring. Um, we'll just see how it goes. Um, the citations, if anybody wants a screenshot or they'll be up on the YouTube video. But again, just some pictures of uh, ships pulled up from uh, uh, Wikipedia um, with uh, fair license uh, um, rights, and uh, let's get into it. So again, we're uh, interested in talking about what shapes a watercraft. Um, so to reiterate, it's an artifact. It's something that's made by human hands. Um, it's a combination of simpler tools and technologies. So um, something like a nail uh, is a technology. Um, something like a radar unit is a technology and a ship is an accretion of all these things. Um, it's the product of a certain set of material technologies. So by and large, what kind of uh, watercraft, boat, ship, your uh, culture comes up with, you come up with, um, has a lot to do with what you have access to in terms of raw material. So um, looking over the last 200 years of sailing ships, the, uh, the major developments have been because of uh, the uh, um, more ready availability of uh, industrial produced uh, iron and steel. Um, and as soon as the material was available, the technology of shipbuilding jumped forward, whether that's uh, cheap metal fasteners or making the whole thing out of steel. Um, a ship or boat addresses a more or less specific problem. So it's uh, meant to uh, um, do a thing um, or do several things. But the fewer things it's meant to do, the better off uh, you're going to be in getting a, a design that uh, really answers the question. And a ship or boat is a product of a geographic context. So hot, cold, windy, not windy, um, inland, um, open water, these are all going to have a big effect on uh, what you end up with. And today I would like to talk about using recipes and rules of thumb. So um, the, the way we build ships today, generally, hopefully with some exceptions, is uh, scientifically. Um, a naval architect does the math, um, understands the uh, characteristics and strength of the materials involved and produces a ship um, after, after doing that. Um, this was not how things were done in the Stone Age. This is not how things were done in the Bronze Age and until very recently. Um, in, in some contexts. So a lot of boat building, especially shipbuilding um, too, is a matter of having a process that you've worked out over time, over generations and applying that process. It's not usually a precise process. Um, it's something which doesn't usually require uh, literacy or uh, a lot of mathematical skill beyond uh, simple geometry that you can do with uh, just understanding how shapes interact. Um, so being able to scribe out an arc of a circle, for example, or uh, using, uh, using triangles. Um, and we'll get into uh, today um, two recipes for boat building, which you can use at home. Um, and genuinely, these are things that I think a lot of you could build uh, more or less successfully, um, wear your life jacket if you do. 
and uh, we'll have some models to illustrate. So that should be exciting too. So the first boat type I'd like to talk about is a really modern one. Um, this is a Carolina skiff. Um, I worked in a project documenting these. Um, they're from uh, Kirtuck County in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And this is basically an inland waterway. So um, big, swampy, not very deep, not very rough. Um, and you, you want a shallow boat for those waters. Um, typically, these would be uh, rowboats and later motorboats. Um, you'll see brackets on the back of uh, a couple of these examples for uh, um, to mount a, uh, a two-stroke, four-stroke uh, engine. And um, the interesting thing about these to me, one of the interesting things, is that this is an example of a watercraft that is not scientifically designed. It's built by a recipe. Um, it, it's built by rules of thumb. Um, and it's modern enough. Um, some of these examples are you now uh, um, from less than 100 years old, uh, 100 years ago. Um, it's modern enough that we uh, um, can talk to the people who made them and understand the process. Whereas if we're looking back further, uh, the, the other examples will be from more like a thousand years ago. We have to interpolate a lot more what the, uh, the process of building was. We, we can't ask and it wasn't written down. So you'll notice about this, uh, this vessel type. Um, again, it's, it's flat and shallow. The intended use for uh, a boat like this is hunting and fishing. It's the right size to uh, get in with uh, a dog, a uh, six pack of grape soda, uh, your duck hunting gun or a fishing pole. And that's, uh, that's all the cargo has to carry. Um, but it does have to be something that, uh, you know, one person can uh, drag out of the water, uh, drag up on shore. Um, and it's uh, something that should fit on a trailer later on as we get into the 20th century. And uh, since I see Chuck uh, looking around up and down here and he can't talk, I'm just gonna check the chat. No, are we okay? Okay, and I'm gonna move on. So if you look at these skiffs, you can tell they're pretty flat. Um, there's just a tiny bit of uh, arc to the bottom of the craft, a little more on top um, and this is a very late example of shell first construction. Um, and we'll talk about how to build one of these. Um, square transom, um, again, it's uh, uh, meant for one person, uh, sometimes two or three, but typically one. And you'll, you'll want a, uh, a fatter section of boat aft um, to uh, um, accommodate that weight. Um, and also you can see uh, outboard engine was mounted on here at some point. Uh, that's what that uh, plywood patch is. And the bottom of these is just planked dead across. Um, so just like your hardwood floors, basically. Um, these are um, planks that go athwart ships. Um, so on the short axis and just um, all the way back one by one. Um, here's another example. Um, this is vessel 79, I think. Uh, you can see it's got a little more shear. Um, on this, you can uh, clearly see that there are two strakes. So two planks going uh, all the way from the bow to the stern. Um, typically a 12 inch plank on these. Um, and uh, looking here, it's not a great picture. I apologize, these are the field photos. Um, you can see the, uh, the stem post that we're familiar with from previous classes um, as a major structural uh, um, element as a foundation for building the boat. Um, and you can see, again, the, uh, the bottom is just planked across. And you can see a little bit of uh, what I would call a false keel or a skeg keel, which is just tacked on underneath everything else. So not a structural keel, not a backbone, 
uh, just a support that's added on at the end of the process. Um, looking at the bow again, you can see um, what is uh, our old friend, the, uh, the rabbit. So to uh, some extent, these, uh, these planks are inlaid into the, this um, stem post. Um, they're just nailed on with uh, common sort of hardware store nails. And um, you've got some, uh, some rake to the stem post, um, but that's not necessarily a diagnostic feature in these. They can be straight up and down too. And another look at that stem post. Um, and kind of fix that in your head because that's going to be um, important to the process um, as you go on. This is just looking straight down. And you can also see a lot of straight cuts on this. Here's the, the bottom of the same boat. Um, you see that uh, false keel or skeg keel um, broken off um, going uh, underneath the vessel. This is looking from the stern forward. Um, and you can see some copper plates on there that were probably patches added on because that, uh, that bottom that's just planked straight across, not the, uh, not the most watertight thing after a couple of years. So that is, uh, um, by the looks of it, uh, steel or copper, I can't tell now, um, but just get the kind of thing you patch your roof with. And here's my favorite of the, the bunch, uh, Vessel 74. Um, you can see compared to the other ones, this has more shape. Um, it's not a bad looking boat. And this is not the simplest boat you can build as we uh, uh, determined early in the class, the simplest boat you can build is a slightly improved log. But this is the simplest boat that I'd wanna be seen in. And uh, a couple of people could probably knock one of these together more or less in a weekend. Again, the stem post, this one with a scarf. Um, I don't know if that was original or added later. Um, the interior, um, as we talked about uh, last class, Michelle first construction, um, the supports are added later on. So the frames going up and down um, and the uh, various stringers um, are all tacked in after the basic uh, skin of the boat is put together. Um, this example has a plywood bottom. So just a couple of sheets of four by eight uh, standard plywood. It's got that interior keel that's, uh, or keelson that's added on afterwards as a stiffener and a couple of seats. And you can see in the stern here, uh, looking aft, um, there are two stern posts or transom posts uh, would probably be the most precise term. But uh, in the, the massive timber in the corner, there is a main structural element that's tying everything together. And now, I'd like to try some model work. So be prepared for uh, me to push the screen around and turn lights on and off and uh, generally make a fool of myself but I will show you how in a few uh, short steps, you can construct a Carolina skiff. That should about do. So um, plank stock, your posts, your bag of nails. So you're going to start with some stout posts, like four by four, something like that. And you are going to drive them into your backyard. Um, the uh, stem post, you're going to want to have a little bit of an angle on. Um, so you can see that uh, I filed that down to a point a little bit. Um, this doesn't have to be um, the, uh, the most engineered thing in the world. You can uh, kind of um, make it up as you go along to a certain extent. So put the pieces in and, you know, hold up the next piece. If it doesn't fit, then uh, file a little bit off. Um, stem post, two stem posts, drive them into the backyard um, with, you know, three, four feet underground. So they're nice and steady. And you're gonna be building this boat upside down. And this is by a recipe. 
not a plan per se. Um, but I've uh, I put these turn posts, so they're roughly uh, half um, half the length of the boat apart. So if this direction is two, this one is one. And you're going to be building this boat upside down. So um, any uh, any curve you want to build in, um, any uh, any rake you want to build into the stem or stern, you would uh, put in when you drive the posts. So for a typical shape, we'd have everything tilted in towards the center point just a little bit. Um, I'm not going to do that here. Otherwise, you're going to be watching me spending hours and hours trying to put this together. Then put your planks on. These East Carolina skiffs are always uh, a little under 16 feet uh, in length, uh, typically 15 and a half, 15 and a quarter. And that's because the sawmill around there uh, put out 16 foot planks. And uh, that's about as big as you'll fit your pickup truck anyways. So that is a, a pretty concrete modern example of materials dictating, um, dictating how, uh, how things take shape. All right, so bang on a couple of planks. Anybody can do this, even after a couple of grape sodas. Oh, that's uh, some fine carpentry here. That gives you, <laughs> that gives you the basic boat shape of the boat. Um, but it's a little too pointy in the, uh, the front part. So how do you solve that? You get the uh, tire jack out of your uh, pickup truck and spread the front of the vessel. Not a whisper of a lie here, that's how you do it. Um, that is the traditional East Carolina way of shaping the vessel. And then from there, you uh, pop on a transom, pop some uh, planks on the bottom, cut off anything that doesn't look like it fits, um, typically you'll have two or three planks uh, on the side. Um, when you've got the structure uh, more or less there, you can uh, uh, cut it off at ground level, uh, trim to fit, and then put in the interior structure. And Bob is, as they say, your uncle. And literally, you can do this in a weekend at home. So going back to the PowerPoint, how do we do a slightly more complex vessel, um, like our uh, old friend, friend the, uh, the Draken here? Um, and how are they doing it uh, you know, a thousand years ago? Um, same general sort of process. Um, you build the, uh, the skin first after you put in the, uh, um, the foundation in the form of the keel, the stem post, the stern post. Um, you plank it up and you put in the inside parts. Um, now we'll go into a little more detail on that um, as we go. Get this to advance here. Um, oh, and is that, that might be cut off, but the, uh, the first part you find somebody who can uh, make you a wicked cool dragon head like this, um, because without that, there's hardly any point. Um, but we're, we're talking about vessels like the, uh, the Sutton Hoo ship. Um, the, uh, the Sutton Hoo ship is a, uh, well, it's, it's not really there. Um, it's an archeological find um, from the 1920s. We date it to probably around 600 AD, 600 uh, CE um, and uh, in England. Um, it was uh, basically uh, a stain in the dirt when it was found. So all of the organic and inorganic parts of the uh, boat that was a uh, part of a burial mound 
had uh, degraded, but the, uh, the process of degradation uh, left staining and a little bit of texture change in the uh, soil. So what you're looking at is uh, the excavation and uh, you can see pretty clearly the planks, the fasteners, the frames, um, but that is all just discolored soil that has uh, carefully been uh, um, dug out around. Um, we do have some better examples of the general type. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, Skaldalev vessels, uh, two of them actually, um, at the uh, Roskilde Viking Ship Museum. And again, you can see the, the small keel running the whole length. The, uh, uh, the stem post and the stern post are uh, either there to a little bit of an extent or indicated by the, uh, the metal framing. Um, and then it's planked up afterwards um, and the floor timbers are added in. And uh, actually with this particular type, this is a 1030 to 1050 CE. Um, we think by uh, uh, dendrochronology by dating the tree rings. Um, this type, you would uh, uh, build the, uh, the planks first and then frame it out and then frame up a little and then build the planks first. So it's, it's a sort of an inflection point in the transition from shell first to frame first. Um, another view of uh, one of those vessels, a smaller one. So our old friend, um, and I'll be selling autograph prints of this, uh, the, uh, the keel, that's where you start. Representing that, I have, uh, this is a cutoff from a deck plank on the uh, constellation. Um, so that uh, is what really good old growth Douglas fir looks like. Um, you can see it's got a crazy tight grain pattern. Yeah, the stem post and the stern post. Um, they have a rabbit, uh, as we talked about, which is a notch running the length of the keel and up the stem and uh, stern. And uh, that is going to allow the, uh, the first strike, the garbage strike, the first plank to mechanically lock in and uh, be very strong uh, aside from the fasteners. And I'll bump out a sharing again. How are we doing on time? Get my next uh, very intricate uh, model. Find my box of nails. There we go. So you have a keel, stem post, notch those together using any variety of uh, carpenter scarves. And then your first strike, your garbage strike. Chuck's got a toddler over there and I wonder which one of us is uh, playing with better toys. <laughs> All right. So how long is your keel? As long as it needs to be. Um, no longer than the trees that grow in your area, in this era. And, uh, you know, it's gonna be based on what kind of trade the, uh, um, the ship's gonna go into. But uh, uh, typically with this kind of uh, ship, um, you know, 20 feet for a small one and uh, 70 or 80 for a big one. And then you just uh, start adding strikes. You know, the next one goes on there. You build it a little curve as you go. So you do better if you uh, get a tree that's a little bent. Um, and uh, the grain structure helps you out at the extremes of the vessel, but you're also using heat, steam, or just uh, muscle power to uh, bend some curve into it. And then as you go up, you just add on, you trim off what doesn't look like a boat, 
And on the upper strakes, you're more likely to have more than one plank um, going across the length of the boat. So that's all very easy to do in paper. How does it work in lumber? Um, effectively, um, the, uh, the planks have to be beveled to each other to uh, build up any kind of height with any kind of strength. So um, if you just build them up straight on like yay, um, you're not gonna have very much shape to the, to the vessel. Um, it's it's going to be narrow and uh, ungainly. Um, if you have too much angle, then you don't have a lot of strength in fastening. Um, so you want to uh, find a medium that is going to give you a good bearing surface to fasten on, and is going to give you as you progress the uh, the shape of the vessel um, as as it bells out. And this can either be um, a series of the same angle or different angles as you go. Um, so how do you do that without being able to read, write, uh, count past 10, what have you? Um, one of the simple ways and uh, ways known in antiquity is the control level. So here, uh, made out of cardboard, not lumber, but uh, just uh, ready to go to the shipyard today is a basic control level. Um, I made this by eyeball. I think it's about nine degrees per side, giving a total angle of about 18 degrees. But uh, you um, use that to set the angle of the planks relative to each other. And you can also use it to bevel off the uh, the edge of the plank that's already on the ship. And as you build up, the, uh, the angle compounds and you have a rounded out shape. And here is an example of what you get using that particular control level. Um, and is it cut off at the bottom? Maybe, but uh, you get the idea. You have your, uh, your keel at the bottom and uh, the, uh, the planks radiating out um, at the same angle. I don't know what, that, what angle that actually is. I think it's about 18, 20 degrees. I don't need to know. If it makes uh, uh, a shape that looks like a ship, then it's good enough. Um, and Got another one. This is another attempt. This is a reverse bevel coming out of the uh, uh, the keel, so it goes down and then works up, um, and that uh, you know it's starting to dial into something that looks like a ship. Now that doesn't have to be um, uh, the same angle on every plank. It can be a different angle on every plank. Um, it can be a different uh, width on every plank. And you can do that with a different uh, sort of control level. So this is the Controlizer uh, 4000. Um, and uh, you can see just using a compass, I've marked this side out in arcs. So 90, uh, 45, 22 and a half, 11 and a quarter. And you can set the angle of your bevel using this guy. Um, and uh, it's just a plumb bob on a radius with enough of a uh, pan handle that it can level off to a plank. The great thing about this method is, uh, I'll switch it over to the other side here, which is marked differently. You can have a different measurement for every plank. So let's say we want the first one to be at that angle. And then the next one is about the same. 
And then for whatever reason, we want to take a big jump. Um, we have a sharp turn of the bilge there. And then the rest of them, they just go in small increments. You can do that. You can mark out those progressive angles um, on the face of the, uh, uh, the level and uh, just go along as you go and make both sides uh, the same. You can also use this to uh, uh, take down notation on what uh, an existing vessel looks like. So say it's uh, the year 1000 and you wanna build a boat in uh, Olaf down the uh, fjord, has a very nice looking uh, uh, nor, um, and you want it to look like that. And you say it's uh, 20 paces long, it's uh, three paces wide, and you take a, a blank control uh, level and you just uh, start making notches on every plank. Um, and as long as you don't go past 90 degrees, which is not recommended practice, um, you've got an accurate record and a repeatable record of what the uh, bevel angle of each plank is as you go up. Um, and, you know, again, Bob's your uncle. Um, we think we don't know um, that some sort of reference molding would have been used to build these ships. Um, so um, molding in the modern sense is a fixed structure um, like an arch, uh, wooden wooden arch that you use to actually build out to when you're making a fiberglass boat, for example. Um, the opposite of a cake mold. Um, we think that uh, probably they were using some sort of visual reference, but weren't actually building to precisely that. Um, so you would, uh, simplest thing to do and get yourself a nice bendy piece of wood and just bend it into an arc and i'm not going to go all the way with this or it'll snap but bend it until you've got a uh, a nice arc um, you know that uh, olaf's boat is three paces across in the middle um, you bend a uh, uh, flexible branch um, and connect it in the middle with uh, you know, six feet of string and put it uh, on top of the keel, halfway down the, uh, the keel. And that's what you're gonna be shooting for as you build the sides out. Um, question from uh, Ricardo, is there archeological evidence of such a uh, uh, dive you showed last or does it come from the ethnographical record? Um, there's some archaeological uh, evidence. Um, it's, it tends to be the kind of thing where you're interpreting little scratches on a boat that was 1,500 years old before it was put in the ground. Um, so there's a lot of interpolation there. Um, but this is a, I'd say, a solid best guess on how you do uh, backyard uh, 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 What's the word I'm looking for? Back, backyard mathematics without uh, knowing your numbers. All right. And finally today, um, I'd like to uh, talk about um, sort of the introduction to uh, the modern age of shipbuilding which is writing things down, using models, um, using numbers and transferring things. So just to pr prove that I can draw when my uh, uh, back is against the wall, here's a plan I did of one of those skiffs you saw earlier. This is a uh, Currituck County skiff number 74. Um, this is a scale drawing, uh, foot to the inch. Again, you can see it's uh, just shy of 16 feet because uh, that's, uh, how long the boards were before they got bent. Um, and uh, this is an accurate reproduction of the actual vessel um, within limits and uh, can be used to reproduce that vessel. Um, and just in our final minutes before questions here, I'd like to dive into how that's done. And I'll be back in just a second as I can grab that model.
feel like I'm doing prop comedy here. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, all of this stuff had to uh, be placed out of the reach of the cats because, you know, it's made out of string and paper. And... So by the, uh, the late uh, period of uh, sailing vessels, you are building up of models uh, quite a lot. Um, part of this is that it uh, allows the uh, shipbuilding industry, the defense industry in a lot of cases, to uh, um, propose something in concrete form before building it. And, uh, you know, take that to uh, the Admiralty, to London or Paris or whatever, and say, um, say, uh, it's, uh, we want to, should we build it like this? Now, uh, let's make it a little uh, finer in the bow, um, what have you. So, to record from a model and work from a model, or to record a boat in um, situ, All right, so let's pretend this is a full-size watercraft like we have at the museum, but we don't have on Zoom. Um, the way you would record these lines is if you possibly can, turn it upside down. Um, it'll be a lot easier. And uh, try to head on there. Then as close as uh, you possibly can to uh, along the axis of the keel, it's got flat keel, you can use the keel itself, but um, as close as you can to that axis, um, run a tape measure. Um, I don't know if it shows up on camera, but this uh, particular piece of string is marked out in half inch increments. We'll call that a unit for the purpose of this. And you're going to uh, measure out um, unit by unit and make a grid of what the, uh, the shape of the vessel is. I've spent many hours doing this, but uh, not usually this small. So measuring out from the grid, you uh, um, establish points uh, fore and aft, um, up and down, and in and out. So just making a grid one, two, three, four down, go back a station or a unit, countdown, measuring uh, distance out every time. And by doing that, you um, um, establish the, the point space, um, which you'll be making your uh, drawings out of. We build aircraft the same way. I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse. <laughs> so, so typically this is done in stations or slices. Um, you sort of abstractly determine what those uh, stations are going to be based on guesswork and the size of the vessel. Um, every foot for a small boat, um, you'd want it further apart for the Titanic. Um, and you, uh, you typically have uh, inter-station uh, measurements for where things are really happening, like the bow on this turn where there's a lot of change. And uh, having done that, you uh, plot it all out on paper. And uh, because the whole thing's made out of bent wood, you can connect the dots by using a bendable piece of wood. And it should take basically the same shape as the uh, actual vessel itself. So that exhausts my uh, supply of uh, carefully two in the morning last night prepared models. Um, but uh, I'm sure I blasted through that quickly enough that there are some questions. So if you want to pop those in the chat, um, we can take it from there. Henry says, who has a truck that has a 16 foot bed? Nobody, but uh, you can uh, get a 16 foot bed, uh, plank in a standard bed and have a little hanging out, but uh, still have enough of the weight inside the truck that uh, you'll get it all home.
yeah, if there are any uh, of the, uh, perhaps the uh, physical comedy that you'd like to see again, <laughs> I can uh, I can reach everything from here. Um, but yeah, I, that's that's why this is so much better to do in person because it makes sense. It's, it's something that happens in the real world and it makes sense when you can touch it and you know jam the two pieces of lumber together and see how it must work. Is there a wood of choice for planking and frames? Um, again, um, it's what grows in your backyard. So all of those skiffs um, from North Carolina are built out of uh, juniper, which in the uh, local accent is uh, something more like Jennifer and uh, is what uh, most of us would call Eastern uh, red cedar. Um, but it's, uh, it's the same plant that makes a juniper bush. Um, it just grows to tree size down there um, if uh, given enough space. And it's, uh, it's a flexible resinous wood um, and is pretty rot resistant. Um, strong for its weight, takes a bend okay. And so that is the planking and framing lumber for those vessels um, in almost every case. Um, oak is uh, more expensive and heavier and uh, everything else, uh, I don't think they get locally in those sizes or they didn't 100 years ago. Um, but generally, if I were talking about a generic vessel or just making a wish list. Um, white oak is really the, uh, um, the most desirable wood for planking and framing a vessel, um, especially framing. Um, there are um, various subspecies, including live oak, which I think is generally regarded as the best, the, the strongest, um, but, uh, any sort of white oak is good, um, but uh, other things are an option. Um, Niagara is all softwood, so I think she's uh, by and large yellow pine. Um, there might be uh, some some oak planks that snuck in there over the years, um, but pine, Douglas fir, things like that are mostly what you see. Um, is there anything such thing as too much water displacement? Oh yes, oh yes. Uh, before dredging, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, if you live in a shallow part of the world, you want a shallow boat. Um, how long did it take to record, measure, and dry out that Carolina skiff? Oh, I probably could have built it in the time it took to record it. <laughs> but uh, um, we, this, this was when I was back at East Carolina University and we, um, we did three or four recordings, just, uh, just measuring out the points in a two person team in a weekend and then trying it and making it look good a couple of days. Um, yeah, and I'm sure if I did a million of them, they'd, uh, they'd be faster, but uh, yeah, it, it takes a little bit of time. Um, Eric says, I imagine half models are created with measurements the same way you just described. As a kid, I always wondered which came first, the ship or the half model. Um, yeah, it can, it can go either way. I mean, you can make, uh, make a model to build a ship and then, you know, make, make a model of the ship and then back and forth and back and forth as many times as you want to, um, as long as you're accurate. Um, I've often joked about uh, going to business making half models. And uh, my first one would be uh, uh, cement barge. So just a, you know, gray square man mounted on a nice piece of mahogany. Um, but uh, yeah, um, typically when you're looking at expensive um, state built, um, nation built vessels, there was a model first. Um, less likely in personal watercraft. Um, and then often from the actual vessel, you'll build more models. Salomon Etsy, yeah, yeah.
All right. Well, it seems to be slowing down. If there are any other questions, uh, throw them in there. And uh, next week, um, we'll be talking about uh, uh, frame first uh, shipbuilding. So the, uh, the modern stuff um, from the era of uh, the Great Age of Sail, um, as it's called, and further on until big wooden ships go, uh, go out of, uh, um, go out of fashion, go out of common usage, um, which is around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the plans you can access at the National Maritime Museum of Greenwich were probably for models, not the ship itself. Um, I don't know. Um, I think there's probably examples of sort of all of the above. So I know it was common to practice when um, the, uh, the British took a prize ship and they liked it. Um, they would pull down the, uh, the lines and uh, um, put it on record. Um, I imagine that if you were building, say, a, a first rate ship, it would start out as either a set of plans or a model, but the, the model is what would get trucked around as something to, uh, as a demo, um, as a way to sell the, uh, the end product. Um, and, you know, I think if I were actually investing a large amount of, uh, of money in a very large ship, um, probably you're going to be doing plans first at a much larger scale, um, say whole tabletop, um, rather than deriving everything from a relatively small model. But I could, I could see it going any, either way, depending on the context. Chuck, not if that sounds right. Chris asks, how were big ships lofted? I've seen medium-sized boats lofted out on the floor, but wouldn't have thought they drowned something like the HMS Victory, even HMS Trigmaily uh, drowned out one-to-one -one on a floor. Uh, you can. Um, I mean, you're going to be building the, the end product one-to-one. -one. So um, it's easier to loft it out first and make sure the lines make sense, make sure everything runs fair. Um, and, you know, if you think about the, uh, think about the floor of a gymnasium, a high school gymnasium, basketball court, that's big enough to loft out just about any particular line um, in, in building a large vessel. And you can reuse that space over and over with. So the way I've seen it done, you, you loft out everything. The common practice nowadays is to use plywood or door skin um, to, make, uh, to make your pattern out of. And, and only then do you start uh, making it happen in the real world with the, with the real expensive lumber. Uh, Chuck, does that uh, match your, uh, yeah. Uh, Keith says, weren't large logs to use, uh, use to roll the ships off of dry dock? Yeah, that's, that's one of the ways. Um, when you build a boat, it's good to have a plan to uh, get it out of the garage and into the water. Um, so uh, you want to be building close to the water, obviously, and have some way of uh, rolling it down. And uh, in something small, they can just be a couple of rollers cut out of a uh, small tree. Um, the bigger the ship, the, the more involved the process. Um, so as you get into, uh, um, again, more contemporaneous times, um, 17th, 18th, 19th century, you're going to see more processes that look like a, uh, a purpose-built shipway 
um, like a uh, Selectric racing track for uh, your little cars or a railway in some cases. Chris asks, how are the lines from lofting used? Like, how are the timbers measured against the lines? Um, the short answer is it's a process. Um, so typically what you're most interested in lofting out is the sections. So um, if, you're, if you're talking about um, a ship like Niagara, um, you're gonna make a series of arches, upside down arches, um, that are providing the skeleton for the ship. And it compresses into sort of a solid chunk as you get forward and to a certain extent as you get aft. Um, you're using something cheaper than um, the, the end result to make a pattern for that. Um, lofting is just patterning basically, the same as you would, you know, um, sewing, sewing a dress from a pattern. Um, so you're using paper to um, determine what the cuts in the fabric are gonna be. Um, when it's done in modern vessels, um, I say modern when it's done by uh, modern people in historic vessels, um, a lot of these are lofted up using uh, thin plywood and hot glue guns. Um, so you've, you know, you draw out on the on the lofting floor the the arc you'd like to see, and then you stick together little pieces of plywood that uh, compound to make all of the not necessarily the shape itself, but all of the extreme points. And then you derive the, the shape of the actual cut lumber from that. And uh, giving a preview of next week. Um, so this is an example of uh, a very uh, um, superior to my craftsmanship uh, model of a, uh, a set of futtocks for a larger ship. Uh, so this would be a frame section of uh, a very, uh, very wine glass shaped um, hull. Um, so a uh, little bite to it and nice round bilges. And it's made up of individual um, sections or futtocks of oak that uh, uh, overlap each other and build up the individual um, pieces into the overall curve. And you'd be using, as it were, the point cloud that you've made by uh, tacking little pieces of scrap wood together to uh, find out the extreme points of that. And then when you've got them all in place, you've got to ferret out. So uh, run a batten down it, find out what sticks out too much, what's uh, uh, not proud enough and either shim it or trim it down. So you've got an overall nice smooth uh, uh, shape. Anyone else from the uh, from the uh, back of the auditorium? All these techniques are also using vintage aircraft. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, lofting is lofting. Layout is layout. Uh, another question from Chris, and then I think we'll probably uh, um, wrap this up here. Is the surface formed by the lines made of the size of the ribs or the planking? It's made of the ribs. Um, and the planking just goes on afterwards. But you're, you're molding the, the ship to um, the size of the structure, not the size of the skin. Uh, the planking is you know, you don't have to be the uh, the brightest tool in the uh, in the shed to uh, 
to put planking on necessarily. Um, not to disparage any of my shipwright friends, but uh, that's that's not where the most experienced people are working because the uh, the framing dictates the the shape of the vessel and the the planking really just goes on like frosting um, over the top. Um, it's 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 heavy frosting, but it's it's just a skim coat and incidentally connects everything together, but is not dictating the shape of the vessel. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us once again and uh, one more of these and uh, you will be able to uh, build a uh, first rate ship of the line in your own backyard, I, uh, I virtually guarantee. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thanks everybody.